pause. Okay. Yeah, one of the things it's interesting because I'm as I'm reading, I'm like, I, I spoke to you how I had this. It seems like such a stupid, simple thing, but like at work where it's not just about. I, I think I implicitly held that. What is that? That fixed first growth mindset where you have yes. like. I had the fixed one, even though if you say to me, if you would have said to me consciously, like, oh, do you believe people can get good at something? I'd say yes. But on some level, I would have held it because, you know, I do notice there is evidence. It's funny that now that I'm reading this chapter on reason, it's like discussing what tries to get you to question what evidence is. But there's like, you can come up with some explanation or theory to say, in your mind that, oh, well, some people just seem to get good at these things way better than I am, so I just don't have what it takes. But then you can look at everything, like in my case, I look at every all these little things that interested me. I always had that experience. Mm -hmm. I was never natural at anything, whereas I observed other people being natural. But that's, it's, uh, I think there's, there's some error there. And, um, you know, the reason chapter made me think about like that, yeah, maybe it is. There is a is a huge conscious component, and not fully conscious in the sense that, you know, I'm I'm running through every thought process individually. Some of the thought processes are formed and automatic, but they're formed on addict, or formed and automatic based on past thoughts. And so, what if you can completely rebuild the way you think about things, and like the way the questions you ask ask, and the way you approach certain topics? Will you become that person who can master anything? Um, anyway, it's made me question that a lot because I think I had some of the fixed uh, mindset, which is really cool. Even though, and so it's like I said, some of the things seem simple. Like, you know, you might say, okay, I'm just going to sit here and then figure it out in your head. You've got this vague idea of figure it out, like in trading or whatever it is. But it, there's no such thing as figure out. There's no like, what is it, the impression, a thunderbolt from beyond that hits you and suddenly enlightens you with knowledge, which is what he described the intrinsicist view as. And then you, when, when I look at it, I'm like, wow, I actually, maybe I didn't say that, but I uh, sub the implication of the way I approach things in action may have embodied that view. And it made me question like, okay, well, if I'm trying to build it on this different view that uh, knowledge is a conscious volitional process and emotions are automations of previous thoughts, then what would I do? And suddenly I'm trying to approach things differently. So anyway, that, that whole thing is super cool to me that it's simple and it's like, you, you might think, oh, this is so obvious, but it wasn't to me. So um, anyway, that's something I'm pretty excited about. I guess that, that the payoff of that is not immediate. So you don't know. It, it wouldn't be immediate. Um, but you're making me think of a quote I found in the vision of Ayn Rand. It was really just a basic quote. I'm not, uh, just about goals and purpose. The goal or purpose that a mind has set in any given instance determines what material will be fed to it from the subconscious out of the total store of its knowledge. It's really just pointing out that um, having a goal could set the way you think about things and set the way what kind of information you'll get from your mind or what kind of information you'll remember and what different information you'll have access to. And that can determine what you think about or how to move forward in your thinking. What, what does it mean to set the way you look at, like set the way you, what was it? Set the way you something? Set the way, what did you say? Well, if you set the, I'll just, you set your goal. You set your oh, purpose. set your goal everything. and purpose. And that can help the automatic part of your subconscious, like, provide you relevant material or make some of like those associations come up and, and things like that. And setting the goal is a big part of that. Having a purpose in mind is what can provide you those things. Right. Okay. Well, that's like when, I mean, the, the small scale example of that is simply when I ask myself a question and my subconscious might answer. Right. That, 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 that's a, yeah. I've set a purpose. I'm like, what do I want to eat? Subconscious answers, whatever. Right. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like I'm walking in the street and I'm thinking about food necessarily, but I can ask myself that is that's the, that's the same principle. Yeah. Yeah. Like it'd be automatic that like it's become automatized that response or some of the response could be automatized. Like 
when you think of that question, that's some of the, some of the information you present is like emotions related to that even. It presents you the emotions and feelings right. and associations. Right. Hmm. I think one of the more important takeaway points is the connection to the perceptual level. Do you, uh, do you know why? Of what? The connection of what, sorry, to the perceptual level? Knowledge or concepts to the perceptual level. Like, that you can reduce things. That okay. Ability. Okay. Uh, okay. Important in relation to what, sorry, I'm not following. You're saying that's one of, that's an important thing, but what do you mean? Like, well, it's, it's important in the way objectivist epistemology is thought of that everything rests on perceptual evidence and everything stems from that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know why that is? I mean, are you able to repeat why or do you, well, what's I, your understanding of why? Well, let, let me, let me think about it. So existence we, we we begin perceiving everything that is perceptually like um you know through touch through smell through sight like that's the thing that hits us first from when we're babies to uh you know adults why well, I, I mean maybe there's some technical thing of at first it's sensations and then it becomes integrated by the brain into perceptions but whatever let's let's just go with the perceptions thing that that's what yeah. that's how we perceive reality and abstractions are a way for us to then take that material the, the material is what you begin with it's like the ingredients and we can work with that material to to do other things but th those those things that we do with the material when we form it into concepts that's a it's supposed to be a representation of reality but reality primarily i mean the the the, the beginning point is the perceptions so that that's what i mean that's what i understand about yeah yeah, I think that's a pretty good understanding. I wouldn't change any of it, really. I mean, over time, it would be maybe easier to explain, but I think you did a good job. I mean, that sounds pretty accurate. Like, it's our first contact with reality. Any first other concepts with reality. Right? Yeah, that's how I would put it. Yeah. Or the source of all human knowledge is another way to phrase it. Right. But yeah, you had the right idea. And right. I think what you said about sensations and percepts, I think that was accurate too. Like your brain puts those sensations together into a, a perceptor that happens automatically and, mm -hmm. and and that's just how we see reality. And yeah, it's automatic. There's it's not volitional. Right. So yeah. You had the right idea, yeah. And why did you bring it up as imp what did, when you said it was important, what what were you thinking about? Well, I was thinking of how we were talking about setting goals and ways to think about things. I would say another way of it's important to remember about the way we think about things is how it needs to be grounded on perception that we're not just trying to set these goals that apart or away from our experiences, whatever things should be based on well, reality as we perceive it as it is in front of us. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the expression is, even now I was reading in that, that book, Musashi, like they're talking about this man who's practical and not up in the clouds. And this, you know, this book is like 1600s historical fiction written in 1900 that it, it's capturing that same idea that you can uh, just be up in the clouds, like stuck in abstractions and they're not related. Like you can, they're not related to real life and you can sound great, you can sound really sophisticated, but actually like what are you doing with yourself like are you achieving anything so i think mm -hmm. that's what it captures that same idea yes it's got to be related uh mm -hmm. to reality which is pretty hard um i know i don't under well actually what tell me what you think about this because maybe i'm wrong i know i don't understand something if i ask myself about a sentence or a question why is that true and nothing immediately comes up in my subconscious like i know i don't understand it if i because I've had that experience a lot, and that's why I ask so many questions about the passages. Like, how is that true, or why is that true? And nothing, my subconscious doesn't give me an answer. Then I know I don't, I don't get it. I guess it depends how unsure you feel. Yeah, if you don't get it right away, you're not like a master. That's for sure. But 
just because it's not right away doesn't mean you don't. It maybe it just means you have to sort through your ideas a bit slower and a bit longer. It might reflect mm. that you don't know it too well yet, but it it would just reflect you're you're getting there. You're well, building on your understanding. And I mean, how have, long do you give it? You know, like are you gonna I wait know, two days to make sure? Yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's more like if you can't get anything, then yeah, you're you don't understand it really at all, or you can't give a reason. You're just confused, and or either you're confused, or the thing actually is false. Like there's no way to understand it. Uh, more than likely, if you you don't get an answer right away, it just means well, yeah, you probably never considered the question before, and you don't really actually even know the answer. Uh, it's really interesting because I never realized that the feeling of confusion at its essence is one of the identification of a contradiction, which I find it's maybe that simple to you, but I find that amazing because then now that I realize that I'm like, wow, so if I can, which I, I still find difficult, but if I can uncover what premise the emotion is referring to, I can maybe resolve that contradiction. Um, yeah. It's identifying something that my thought or observation is saying is not true and they're, they're like clashing. I, I don't know, that, that idea is really cool. Um, and that's like a key, it seems like that might be a key to um, serenely approaching like the, one of the keys to serenely approaching like the study of some complicated mm -hmm. subject. Like if you're studying maths or physics or anything actually, and you're like, you're like, I don't understand this, this is so confusing. It's like, it's capturing something. And if you can go, okay, there's a contradiction here, what is it? That, and then identify it, like mm -hmm. that would improve your learning process so much. Anyway, super cool insight I had like over the past two days just from reading this, as like I said, mm -hmm. I was reading this chapter yesterday a lot. Yeah. Do you, yeah, you want to change it up and go to the art chapter today and see, we'll just see what that's, what that's like and then we can go back. I mean, this uh, so far I'm not even finished with the reason chapter and I've done um i've probably done like 30 pages of questions so maybe we'll skip that today we can yeah let's switch it up more related to these emotion topics yeah would cool. be art, so yeah yeah perfect. Um, can you link it to me uh yes yeah um, and then i'll give you the actual art one which i think is I found it interesting. So I was reading a bit about Musashi, Miyamoto Musashi, yeah. and because I'm reading the fiction and, um, he was, so he was, uh, I don't know if you know about him, but he was one of the best swordsmen in feudal, feudal Japan. He had like 60, I'm not 100% sure how true this is, but I assume there's a, a significant amount of truth to it since he's written books, nonfiction books himself, and there's stories about him and so on. But he, he had like 60, 60 ch um, what are they called? Challenges? Bouts? I don't, I don't know. Where sword fights? Duels? Oh, yeah, duels, 60 duels, yeah. and he won all 60. But the interesting thing about him is that he was so philosophical and um, and then I remember my friend talking to me and telling me that a lot of like very well-known entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, um, I don't know who else he mentioned, also have this philosophical streak to them. And I was wondering about that, like why, what is that, what, why is it that the, is it the, is it the philosophy that when people say they're philosophical is it that they, have a big vision or it's necessary to in order to achieve highly you must have some kind of consciously thought over philosophy i i don't know but uh i just found it interesting why why musashi this famous swordsman who's like killing all these people and then steve jobs yeah i that's very speculative i mean i agree but i would tend to think it's usually the philosophy that 
allow having some philosophy at least is necessary to do great things to have a vision you need a philosophy like i can't right. even imagine somebody with a vision that doesn't have a philosophy or at least right. some form of philosophy i can mm-hmm. think of any famous person people usually like to listen to what they have to hear i mean you might say it's insane what that person says but it's a philosophy nonetheless usually like whoever it might be they usually there's their way of thinking about things it, it might not necessarily be deep but it's you can always see a philosophy or position yeah, towards the world um maybe like when people people seem to like to know what bill gates has to say on some subject of maybe science or something not strictly computer science or business maybe even philanthropy that he has some vision about what philanthropy philanthropy should be right. you know what moral standards you should have and how to live up to them and what your obligations are ethically to other people or even understanding how it is you come to understand what's right or wrong like like how he funds research and things like that so they usually have some vision of some kind some philosophy of some kind and because if you didn't then it'd be hard to even guide yourself towards any direction you just be spinning in circles, maybe. But you didn't have right. something to guide you. Right. Mm. That's um, usually how I see it. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of what objectivism tries to argue that like, philosophy is fundamental to anything more than just for the moment, like if we're concrete bound, just the immediate now, then we're not really advancing anywhere. But once you start to integrate philosophy and wider abstractions and future thinking and all of that, then we start to advance our potential to advance our own ability because that would be the nature of man to use concepts and reasoning to expand your range of thinking, you expand your range of action. You know, I was just thinking as you're saying that. Um, so, one of the things I was reading last night was uh, so I'm so obviously reading this book. It's a massive book. That's why I keep speaking about it. I'm still going through it. The Musashi book. He, he moves, he ends up in this town, and all the villagers are living fairly hand to mouth. And uh, he decides he's going to cultivate a field, and they're all laughing at him like, you can't cultivate fields here, the rains just sweep everything away. And anyway, so he's working at, on this project, and he's living there, it takes him a while to figure it out. In the meantime, like, these um, these bandits descend on the village and start, like, hacking at the villagers because they come every year to, like, steal food. And then he fights them all off, he, like, kills all these... Vill- all these uh, bandits and he helps the villagers kill the bandits and then he leaves a big sign on the village on his way out um which is something like uh i don't the words were all like in kind of japanese verse or whatever but it was it was something like do not only think of yourselves think of future generations and he tries to embody this philosophy so he's like cultivating these fields he wants to show that we can live like human he keeps talking about living like a real human which is like mastering nature and um, I was thinking about that because in the in the book, what happens is he cultivates the fields and then the villages, this village flourishes. Like it's got all these rice paddies. It's beautiful. People like pass it and they don't realize it's that old village because it's completely transformed. He's shown them how to transform the land. And the thing I was thinking about when I was reading that is not so much future generations, like not in my life, but actually like in that case, what happens when they were future, when you say think of future generations, you're thinking long term and it's almost like, you yourself will have future evolution, uh, future transformation. So like, you know, version one of Louis might be ver- very different from version two of Louis. It was like, there's a future generation of Louis, like everything you're doing now will give birth to the next Louis. And so I thought yeah. that was really cool because it almost, even though they're saying future generations, think of your kids, like you can actually think of it as metaphorically. And it's not even metaphoric because in that book, the, the, the concrete example is that it's not future generations, it's them themselves. Because they're mm-hmm. thinking for the future, they're thinking of the future versions of themselves. And so I guess philosophy does that, which uh, I think is, anyway, it's pretty cool, interesting, exciting. 
uh, it is hard to do. Like, um, that's why that's part of my motivation. Like, like I said earlier, thinking of the future generation of Yoni or Jonathan. Yeah, that's a very, very good way to look at it. I think very observantly. Yeah, I think that's very insightful the way you phrase that. Like, looking forward towards your future generations. Even in psychology, that's known to be really important. How you think of the future, how you visualize the future, how you can keep in mind what you're going towards. If you're too short term, people often get depressed. They don't see it overcome their difficulties. I was reading about this the other day and something about a psychologist who researched happiness and he killed himself. Like it's almost ironic when you study happiness and you end up killing yourself. But a, a lot of it seemed is he was unable to think to the future. Like he really couldn't think. He saw his struggles now and he couldn't foresee into the future. He couldn't think long range enough to say, oh, I can make it through. There's going to be some transformation I'm going to go through. It just it, it feels bad now. Therefore, it's always bad. He couldn't think into the future. He couldn't expand to where he was going. I, I wonder, though, about, you know, I would make a distinction between thinking about the future or, like, being able to... Um, yeah, like uh, think abstractly so you can think. In, I don't, I'm trying to find my words here, but yeah, think abstractly and then project into the future, which I'd say is almost more difficult because like, I mean, this sort of goes into this art chapter because it's, um, yeah, like I was thinking about that recently. Like I've sometimes felt like, oh, I don't have anything to look forward to right now, but my mood varies and sometimes I'm like, I get excited again, but it's so hard to picture like, what will it look like? You don't know. Like that's a whole different process from just thinking abstractly, right? Right. right. So, I mean, there's that question too. It's like maybe you can think into the future, but you still can't like project, uh, let's just say in particulars, what it, what it actually will look like or feel anything about it. You know what I Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is the difficult part. And you're right about that. I mean, if it's just abstract, that's a different thing. Actually visualizing that, I guess, I can show you the value of reducing things or concretizing things that it's more than just abstract. You're making it something perceptual, something you can, your emotions have contact with even to make that recall stronger. Like we talked about before, having like an image or an emotion as a way to remember a concept or an idea as part of reduction. Even Peacock said that was important to do to yeah. reduce it to that. To make it visual, to make it accessible, to make it right more real. Right. Um, what was I thinking of? I can't remember. I was going to say something. Anyway, we can go on because I can't. I can't remember what I was going to say. Yeah, and this is all actually quite related to art. Now that we're talking about like making these things concrete, more real, and emotionally right. real, and things like that. Right. Um, okay. Again, be prepared for lots of stupid questions. Yes. <laughs> no judgment, please. Um, all right. So this is the first uh, it's part of the section. Um, besides the need of a view of the universe covered by Meta, Meta I'll paste, I'll just paste this in the chat. So we'll just, and then you can read it as well. A method of knowledge and a code of values, the only other need within the province of pure philosophy is art. But art pertains to man precisely qua subject of philosophy. Art is a need of the mind, that is, of man qua thinker and valuer. Okay, I'm saying this is too abstract, don't get this, I'll tell you why. Because, like, what, how do they, I, I just don't get how they... They like why they're saying it because then you could say hunting it pertains to you know a man as a thinker and a valuer or like what am I missing here or like you know I need, I need food so cooking is is a pure philosophy because I must um yeah what am I not getting here because I it doesn't yeah or psychology that's mm -hmm. that's for man thinker and valuer as well yeah so I'm a little unsure there? about his wording here that is why like philosophy. So art's always existing. I mean, I don't know if that's a good argument he's making. 
it doesn't seem like a very strong one. But I mean, I don't know why it should be considered as philosophy per se, other than it's a, a deep and very general question that pertains to a wide range of things. But I don't know if it's an important distinction between art as a part of philosophy. That you could have a philosophy of art, but I'm not quite sure why art has to be part of philosophy per se, other than it's a wide generalization. That's about all I could I really say of it. Mm, okay. As far as this paragraph. Yeah, cool. Well, I will, uh, I will come back to that maybe in the future at some point. That's interesting. Or you could think of even art itself as a, a pre-philosophy in a way, because it's a way of integrating the their views on life and ethics and what makes them feel what they feel is beautiful and what they feel is ugly, usually with like mythology. Usually that's straight art and that's even before philosophy ever became a field. It was or maybe even before religion in some cases, like like you have art as old as religion itself. So in a way it's just like an early a form of thinking about our position in the world in, in a more, yeah, it's just a way of thinking about ourselves in the world. Okay. But it's a so much, it's, it's much more, com it's not just like an ethical evaluation, it's based on what you think about the world and how you come to know it, but it's a rough estimate of, I guess, what you think about those things. Or like the yeah. ancient Greeks especially had different ways of thinking about art that could reflect a lot about their philosophy. The different plays they had and things like that. Does it always have to reflect uh um, the artist's view of reality or man can't like, it, or is it just in some cases? Is that what being is? Is that what is being said? In some cases, art is, or is this is what art is ideally? I'm like, I'm just confused about what what exactly. Because no, you know, I, like, yeah. I would say Rand's position is that yes, it will always express something of the creators views on man or existence, like in all cases. Whether it's good or bad is what would be good art, whether it's skillfully done is good or bad art. Whether it's a positive view on man is a way to judge the art. But as far as in general, good or bad, art is uh, a re metaphysical value judgment of reality, a recreation of reality based on their metaphysical value judgments. But the it, thing is, yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, I, I would say though, it, Rand's aesthetic philosophy is very, probably not completely developed, I would say. I would say there's a lot missing to it and a lot could be better done with it. Um, but yeah, that would be her view that you could always make this sort of judgment it's always based on your value judgments. Yeah, okay. Um, but isn't that just like anything else and is based on your value judgments? Like what I eat is based on my value judgments. What So you can look into my food, like read it like tea leaves and go, ah, oh, this is Jonathan's metaphysical value judgments. Like isn't well, any, everything in some sense? Only in the sense like the, the person who created the art is having a recreation of reality in some way and what they choose to recreate about reality would reflect what they view as important or relevant mm. about life or well, their yeah. selection of it well they're just not even thinking about it they're just like sometimes people people just want to draw or something and it just whatever comes to mind but it's like just like you have um you know like you have let me be an angel's advocate here. Like you have, um, you know, you have random subconscious thoughts that don't represent you. Like you might have some 
weird. Uh, I've sometimes had like these random violent inclinations come up, just super very rarely. But you just have this image, and you're like, "What the hell was that?" But it just comes up. So yeah. like maybe an artist might you know decide, "Oh, let me just whatever that little bit of you know like you have what do you call it when you when you eat something and then you have a bit of the acid come up or something." A reflux, acid reflux, uh, whatever it is. Yeah. It's like that, but a subconscious version. So maybe they're just whatever. They just had like something come up, and but it's not like representative of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so that's m me being an angel's advocate. What What do you think of that? This is like, and on some level, they when they're making the piece of art, though, they have to decide: Do I want to include this? Do I want to make this? If do I want to express these? You're assuming that bursts. But that's yeah okay. But or yeah, just I mean, like you're... oh, if you have like no real philosophy about it, just yeah. just go in and start painting wildly. It's like right. well, right. in a way that is your judgment, like right. that you expressed yourself that way wildly without any rhyme or reason, just this impulse, and that could reflect a way of thinking. Yeah, we could argue. Does it mean he's he thinks violence is good? I don't know, but it could say something about the way he thinks we relate to ourselves the way we relate to reality that we just have these impulses and we act out randomly and that yeah. could be its expression. I mean, but it's still can... a bit of a stretch to me, but like, I can see what you're saying, but it's like, it's reading a lot into it. Like maybe it just captures in that moment. He, you know, like, cause we're, a lot of people are so inconsistent, like uh, myself included, like there's all these conflicting things that we think and feel. And, um, you know, maybe he just captured, it just in that moment, he was like, yeah, you know, let's just see what happens when I draw this. Yeah, I think you could argue that. It, it's more to, there's a lot to argue about what does it say about them. You can say it expresses something, but how mm. do we know what that something is? Well, yeah, we could argue about that for a long time. And that's, I think, maybe a big issue. Or actually, the biggest issue in man's aesthetic philosophy that I don't think she gave a good standard of evaluating art. She can say, yeah, there's art is some recreation of reality according to the artist's judgments, but what art what is the artist's judgments? I don't know if there's a really reliable way to do that. And that's the more difficult thing. Can can we say what it is? Probably not. I can't read into their mind, and you're right. You, you can't just say write a story and that somehow reflects automatically everything about them I think you can't just like tea leaves you might think you know what you're seeing but it could be just a story you tell yourself just mm. it might not reflect very much anyway like oh that just means that's how the tea leaves crumble with like I don't know gravity or whatever and like, there's nothing more to say about it you can read into it something just more simple than you realize I guess uh, my my thoughts now are I, there is that distinction between the art piece having making certain metaphysical the art piece representing certain metaphysical value judgments and then psychologizing the artist because they're different right like just like you meet someone in the street or you meet someone out at a party whatever whatever context and they say something like that is and that shocks you or like you're like that's terrible but it's not necessarily representative of them as people and so i think it would be the same in art and like someone can create something and you put the artist aside because you don't really know unless you see a consistent theme across many many artworks just as like you meet a you meet someone like 20 times you get a better picture of who they are so there's that distinction between the artist and the actual piece i think which now is making more sense yeah and it is hard to do and Rand would say there is an objective way to see the meaning within the painting. But I don't know if she even came up with the proper method to do that. Unfortunately, I mean, that's probably the most easy thing to debate within objectivism. So don't feel bad if you have tons of questions. I would usually agree with you, but I do think it's valuable to understand what Rand's position is. So yeah, I do think she can probably takes a stronger position saying that you can judge more than you're saying about a person based on the art that they make. But I think she makes too strong a claim. I think she's too heavy handed in the way she thinks you can judge a person based on what they've created. I think the truth is more closer to what you're saying that 
we might not really even know why they picked this specific thing. The person who made it knows what it reflects about them. But I don't think many of you really could say mm. any more than you could say, why do I get, why would I get upset if I, I don't know, went down a roller coaster or something? Like, it makes everybody else happy, but it makes me sad. It doesn't mean like, oh, I hate the, that joy makes me angry. It's like, it, somebody could say that, but it'd be like insane. That's not why it bothers me. Or something like that. And it's, it's weird why people think certain things, or you'd be surprised what what it was that led them to think that. So it's a very complicated thing to do, to judge what it is that art says about a person. I always think it says something. The difficulty is always, what is the something? It might be, like you're saying, like not mean very much at all. What? Um... We can, can pick this up again, but I'm curious, I was just thinking about uh, going back to that first quote, because um, I, I feel like the, the topic of, you know, so there's the topic of art and its role for us, and then there's the topic of interpreting the artist, no, sorry, uh, analyzing the artist through the art, which I'm less interested in, because it's too, it, yeah. like, it's this too, too complicated to think right. through, and like, I don't know if it's true and all this, but uh, in that first quote, there's like um, uh, a need of the mind. Art is a need of the mind. I don't like the reason I had so many questions about this chapter is because that's not obvious to me. Like, you know, sure, I can see that art is a thing that people do across cultures. But like when I think of myself, it's not something I can go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm hungry. I need art. Like, you know, just like when I walk around the house, I'm like, damn, I'm hungry. Like something, you know, I want to yeah. eat something. I don't have that. Like, so how do I know? Because all this, ab you know, it's when you read it, you're like, yeah, it all sounds good. Yeah, like art is a, you know, fuel and inspiration for the soul. But you're like, all right, prove it to me. Because it's not the same proof as, you know, I can hear my stomach rumbling. Well, I would say it's, yeah, it's not an immediate need like that. But I think it becomes clear over time that the way it, is a cognitive need, not just a feel good thing, but that it enables your very thinking to be future oriented, it enables your thinking to be more philosophical, it enables your mind to think wider. And we can almost think of just when you talk about Musashi, it's you're telling me like all these ways of thinking about like, oh, like improving yourself or what's the next version of you and thinking it's the future or thinking about like what well, action somebody could take to realize their future and all that. It, those are ways of expanding your thinking when you say that you're able to think better with these examples in front of you, right? Yeah. Can you give me an example from your life as well? Let's try if you, if you want to. Let me try to think of one. Um, I'll give a more strange example. So my favorite sci-fi book is Neuromancer. It's not a philosophy in it that I'd, I think is very appealing, but more a way of thinking about the future in terms of technology and science and a way to look into the future, how, how um, we can take these amazing things to the present and where we could take them in the future what possibilities I could have for creating things in the future and even trying to see man from a wider perspective as like, what is our position in the world when technology is all around us and has such an impact on us? It, it's hard to put it in concrete terms, but it, it makes you feel more excited about what the future could be the way technology could be used with computers and consciousness. It's like, it makes me see potential and like a way to orient my thinking and ways to set goals, way to imagine the future in different ways beyond just the abstract, oh, more technology is better. Like I'm actually having ways to visualize it and think about it concretely. Can you give me, uh, can you think of uh, an example of an action it has led you to take or like some need that it has filled like apart from just feeling excited about technology like 
Well, maybe that the role is to feel excited. I don't know, but yeah, and then I, it's something we think about psychology a lot, for sure. It may be interesting more psychology questions, the nature of consciousness and goals of wanting to understand it, not mm. just like, oh, it's a cool story, but it made me think about questions of consciousness and why technology matters to all that. It's just, it, it gives a greater visualization, broader abstraction to my way of thinking about the world or it enables those things. And without it, I could imagine that I wouldn't be spurred on to think about these questions. I wouldn't be thinking as wide range. I'd be still thinking more narrowly about like what technology just exists right now, not thinking about the future, not being trying to orient my thinking towards the future and scientific development and seeing those potentials. But do you think you'd need, you needed the, the art, the, the novel to do that? Like, couldn't you have read a book on, on science or technology and got the same excitement? Like, um, if, it, if it was visualized in the future, probably. But I think there's some way about presenting goals about people that change things. That any novel has to be about people in some way or another. <laughs> And any novel like that can, yeah, it gives me the fuel, but also the material to think about science in relation to meaning in life, purpose in life, things beyond simply, oh, here's a scientific goal, but here's a goal in the context of my existence, rather than simply the goal detached from who you are, or detached from your goals or your life. Mm, I need to think about this more. I was just, I was thinking just now, I wonder if there's a novel about, which is funny that I'm a novel that tries to capture a society without art. Well, there's the movie Equilibrium. It's, not... it's a, it's an okay movie, but it's a world with art is illegal. Oh. And emo emotions are banned. You, everyone has to take a pill that suppresses your emotions. So no wow, emotions, I, no art. Oh my God, I'd love to. Oh wow, that sounds. That's exactly what I'm looking for. With Christian you know, Bale, there is a meetup that I go to, which you may be interested in. Uh, I've mentioned it to you a few times, but they do one of the meetings is like they um, they put uh, in parallel like some art and self improvement concepts, and they use art as a tool to like you know kind of like show show that and I'd, I'd actually consider running one myself on this if I watch it and it resonates and I read a bit more about this like on equilibrium and the need of art on the movie that's really cool I've, bo I've just bookmarked that so and I'll, I'll look up if there's a book as well on could I ask someone wow it's funny that I, I have to th I, I'm like my mind is going is there a book because I can't visualize what it would I can't see it I don't like because I like I said it's not I don't experience it as actual physical hunger. So I actually don't know if it's it's hard for me to go, yes, this is true. Like, how do I validate it, you know? Yeah, that one's um, hard. But yeah, you just keep consuming art, I think. That's usually the best way to do it. I mean, there's so much you can feel about art that you don't always know it until it's not there. That's really the almost the only way to do it. Like, imagine a day without TV, without any art. Or, well, forget that. Imagine, like, a year if you never read a book about art you never saw a tv show you never your life might start to seem i don't know constrained yeah i don't know because i'm i was i went through i at least i think i went through a period where i wasn't really pursuing any art at least not fiction and maybe music i listened to a lot of music back then so it's hard for me to say like I'd need to really do an experiment of like no art at all for like, and then figure out what is art and then just see what happens to me. <laughs> do yeah. I like roll on the floor in depression or, you know, what, what exactly? Anyway, I don't know, but it's, I'd love to actually, I, maybe that's a project I need to do is um, trick myself a full art, no art at all for like four months and see what happens. But anyway, Buddhist monks don't consume art. Really? Then again, there's no music, no singing. 
and no no music no singing okay i guess you guess about sculpture i guess that's true i it would be inaccurate to say there's no art yeah but i don't even know can you really have no art like it's hard to avoid it sometimes like there's p pictures in your house and the probably the maybe a painting or two or any visual image practically would be art practically so it'd be hard to get yeah. away from it almost and all the buddhist sutras as well um, yeah you know like there's all these funny little poems they have yeah, yeah. So there's a lot out there. Um, maybe we can go to this little, this little question. Aesthetics ask, what is art? What is its role in man's life? By what standards should an artwork be judged? Like, how do you, this is the, the difficulty I'm having with this text, is like everything is so logically and neatly compacted. I don't, I don't even know how you get there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're starting, like, you know, we start from metaphysics. We start from, like, existence exists, but it's not like that was the beginning of philosophy. Or at least I yeah. think so. So it makes it hard. Like, how do I, like, you know, when I was looking at that question, I was like, well, if you already consider it a subject, then you have it. You already have a view on what it is, as Partly, opposed yes. to, you know. Yeah, you don't go into it empty, but you would. Uh, it is based on your epistemological thinking, probably. Like you'd start with at least in a rational way of thinking about it. You would start with um, what you see something that's art. You call it art. It's like this is art. You just ask, well, what is it? I mean, what are you calling art? What are you distinguishing as art versus not art? I mean, that's really just the starting point. Just if you're saying something is art, well, well, what is it? Yeah. Like, is your car door art? Is it painting art? Is your is a conversation art? Things mm -hmm. like that. You would have to ask that, or I mean, that's always the easiest thing. I mean, if you're labeling anything, you know be able to define it, say what it is, right. what about it. It means you have some view already, okay. Yeah, and I, you can't just come into it empty, I think. Like, tabula rasa completely, nothing there to begin with. And, and then from there, you can start to, depending on how you answer that, you might start to ask, what is it, the role in my life? And that you were saying art is something about the way the artist judges the world around them. You would have to understand well is there what does even matter or why am i even asking this question if you're trying to go deeper than just asking what is it but you're trying to ask figure out what role it has in your life and usually aesthetics what has to do with that because it's about beauty about under um, your relation to the universe your or things like that you would, so basically even how you define art could lead you to this next question, well, if it's about mankind and if it's about our role in reality, or however you define it as, even whatever definition you might use, you would have to start thinking about, well, if it's about man, what does it have a function in my life? Is there a function? And if there is, what is that function? Like, is it doesn't matter if we label something as art, or we can just let it be whatever and just ignore it, even is it? Going from there, like you ask, does it, like we're asking, can you live life without art? Would mm. you be fine? Is it a need or is it just a convenience? That's my question. Yeah, I want it to be the, you know, like, well, it's funny, we're talking, remember, I keep going back to that thing, the book you recommended, and uh, Leonard Peikoff describes, you want to make abstractions as real as the truck coming towards, coming towards yes. you. So I, I need this. It's It's funny that I'm using a truck coming towards me, the image of a truck coming towards me as a representation for I want to make this idea that art is a need, like a truck coming towards me, because I don't yet see, I don't yet really truly feel, I'm not sure basically is the, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. Like, 
when you understand something, it's like you feel it. it just bam, you, you just Yeah, you it. feel it. Exactly. You, well, you understand, you can explain it. Um, yeah. And it goes back to that conversation we had earlier. I was like, this is obviously not true, but I thought about like understand, meaning underneath, and then there's a stand, so you know the structure, like you know the contextual and hierarchical structure of the concept, so that's the conscious level. And then there's the feeling, which is like you just get it and you feel confident and you feel, yeah, I, I don't know, there's there's a two parts, so. Yeah, I think that's the real part of it.